My Favorite Murder From the Parenticide Club by Ambrose Bierce This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman My Favorite Murder by Ambrose Bierce Having murdered my mother under circumstances of singular atrocity, I was arrested and put upon my trial, which lasted seven years. In charging the jury, the judge of the court of acquittal remarked that it was one of the most ghastly crimes that he had ever been called upon to explain away. At this my attorney rose and said, May it please, Your Honor, crimes are ghastly or agreeable only by comparison. If you were familiar with the details of my client's previous murder of his uncle, you would discern from his later offense, if offense it may be called, something in the nature of tender forbearance and filial consideration for the feelings of the victim. The appalling ferocity of the former assassination was indeed inconsistent with any hypothesis but that of guilt, and had it not been for the fact that the honorable judge before whom he was tried was the president of a life insurance company, that took risks on hanging, and in which my client held a policy, it is hard to see how he could decently have been acquitted. If your honor would like to hear about it for instruction and guidance of your honor's mind, this unfortunate man, my client, will consent to give himself the pain of relating it under oath. The district attorney said, Your honor, I object. Such statements would be in the nature of evidence, and the testimony in this case is closed. The prisoner's statement should have been introduced three years ago, in the spring of 1881. In a statutory sense, said the judge, you are right, and in a court of objections and technicalities, you would get a ruling in your favor, but not in the court of acquittal. The objection is overruled. I accept, said the district attorney. You cannot do that, the judge said. I must remind you that in order to take an exception, you must first get this case transferred, for a time, to the Court of Exceptions, on a formal motion duly supported by affidavits. A motion to that effect by your predecessor in office was denied by me during the first year of this trial. Mr. Clerk, swear the prisoner. The customary oath having been administered, I made the following statement, which impressed the judge with so strong a sense of comparative triviality of the offense for which I was on trial, that he made no further search for mitigating circumstances, but simply instructed the jury to acquit, and I left the court without a stain on my reputation. I was born in 1856 in Kalamakee, Michigan, of honest and reputable parents, one of whom heaven has mercifully spared to comfort me in my later years. In 1867 the family headed to California, and settled near Niggerhead, where my father opened a road agency, and prospered beyond the dreams of avarice. He was a reticent and saturnine man then, though his increasing years have somewhat relaxed the austerity of his disposition, and I believe nothing but his memory of the sad events for which I am now on trial prevents him from manifesting a genuine hilarity. Four years after we set up the road agency, an itinerant preacher came along, and having no other way to pay for the night's lodging which we gave him, favored us with an exhortation of such power that, praise God, we were all converted to religion. My father at once sent for his brother, the Honorable William Ridley of Stockton, and on his arrival turned over the agency to him, charging him nothing for the franchise nor plant, the latter consisting of a Winchester rifle, a sawed-off shotgun, and an assortment of masks made out of flour sacks. The family then moved to Ghost Rock and opened a dance house, it was called the Saints' Rest Hurdy-Gurdy, and the proceedings every night began with prayer. It was there that my now sainted mother, by her grace in the dance, acquired the sobriquet of the Bucking Walrus. In the fall of 75, I had occasion to visit Cherokee, on the road to Mahala, and took the stage at Ghost Rock. There were four other passengers, about three miles from Niggerhead, the persons whom I identified as my Uncle William and his two sons held up the stage. Finding nothing in the express box, they went through the passengers. I acted a most honorable part in the affair, placing myself in line with the others, 
holding up my hands and permitting myself to be deprived of forty dollars and a gold watch. From my behavior, no one could have suspected that I knew the gentleman who gave the entertainment. A few days later, when I went to Niggerhead and asked for the return of my money and watch, my uncle and cousin swore they knew nothing of the matter, and they affected a belief that my father and I had done the job ourselves in dishonest violation of commercial good faith. Uncle William even threatened to retaliate by starting an opposition dance house at Ghost Rock. As the Saints' rest had become rather unpopular, I saw that this would assuredly ruin it and prove a paying enterprise, so I told my uncle that I was willing to overlook the past if he would take me into the scheme and keep the partnership a secret from my father. This fair offer he rejected, and I then perceived that it would be better and more satisfactory if he were dead. My plans to that end were soon perfected, and communicating them to my parents, I had the gratification of receiving their approval. My father said he was proud of me, and my mother promised that, although her religion forbade her to assist in taking human life, I should have the advantage of her prayers for my success. As a preliminary measure, looking to my security in case of detection, I made an application for the membership in the powerful order, the Knights of Murder, and in due course was received as a member of the Ghost Rock Commandery. On the day my probation ended, I was for the first time permitted to inspect the records of the order and learn who belonged to it, all the rites of initiation having been conducted in masks. Fancy my delight when, in looking over the roll of membership, I found the third name to be that of my uncle, who indeed was a junior vice-chancellor of the order. Here was an opportunity exceeding my wildest dreams. To murder I could add insubordination and treachery. It was what my good mother would have called a special providence. About this time something occurred which caused my cup of joy already full to overflow on all sides, a circular cataract of bliss. Three men, strangers in that locality, were arrested for the stage robbery in which I had lost my money and watch. They were brought to trial and despite my efforts to clear them and fasten the guilt upon three of the most respectable and worthy citizens of Ghost Rock, convicted on the clearest proof. The murder would now be as wanton and reckless as I could wish. One morning I shouldered my Winchester rifle, and going over to my uncle's house, near Niggerhead, asked my Aunt Mary, his wife, if he were at home, adding that I had come to kill him. My aunt replied with her peculiar smile, that so many gentlemen called on that errand, and were afterward carried away without having performed it, that I must excuse her for doubting my good faith in the matter. She said I did not look as if I could kill anyone. So, as a proof of good faith, I leveled my rifle and wounded a Chinaman who happened to be passing the house. She said she knew whole families that could do a thing of that kind, but Bill Ridley was a horse of a different color. She said, however, that I could find him over at the other side of the creek in the sheep lot, and she added that she hoped the best man would win. My Aunt Mary is one of the most fair-minded women I have ever met. I found my uncle down on his knees engaged in skinning a sheep. Seeing that he had neither gun nor pistol handy, I had not the heart to shoot him, so I approached him, greeting him pleasantly, and struck him a powerful blow on the head with the butt of my rifle. I have a very good delivery, and Uncle William lay down on his side, then rolled on his back, spread out his fingers, and shivered. Before he could recover the use of his limbs, I seized the knife that he had been using, and cut his hamstrings. You know, doubtless, that when you sever the tendo Achilles, the patient has no further use of his legs. It is just the same as if he had no legs. Well, I parted them both, and when he revived he was at my service. As soon as he comprehended the situation, he said, Samuel, you have got the drop on me, and can afford to be generous. I have only one thing to ask you, and that is that you carry me to the house and finish me in the bosom of my family. I told him that I thought that was a pretty reasonable request, and I would do so if he would let me put him into a wheat sack. He would be easier to carry that way, and if we were seen by neighbors en route, it would cause less remark. He agreed to that, and going to the barn I got a sack. This, however, did not fit him. It was too short, and much wider than he. So I bent his legs, forced his knees up against his breast, 
and got him into it that way, tying the sack above his head. He was a thick man, and I had all that I could do to get him onto my back, but I staggered along for some distance until I came to a swing that some of the children had suspended to a branch of an oak. Here I laid him down and sat upon him to rest, and the sight of the rope gave me a happy inspiration. In twenty minutes my uncle, still in the sack, swung free to the sport of the wind. I had taken down the rope, tied one end tightly to the mouth of the bag, thrown the other across the limb, and hauled him up about five feet from the ground. Fastening the other end of the rope also about the mouth of the sack, I had the satisfaction to see my uncle converted into a large, fine pendulum. I must add that he was not himself entirely aware of the nature of the change that he had undergone in his relationship to the exterior world, though in justice to a good man's memory, I ought to say that I did not think he would in any case have wasted much of my time in vain remonstrances. Uncle William had a ram that was famous in all the region as a fighter. It was in a state of chronic constitutional indignation. Some deep disappointment in early life had soured its disposition, and it had declared war upon the whole world. To say that it would butt anything accessible is but faintly an expression of the nature and scope of its military activities. The universe was its antagonist, its method that of a projectile. It fought like the angels and devils, in mid-air, cleaving the atmosphere like a bird describing a parabolic curve and descending upon its victim at just the exact angle of incidence to make the most of its velocity and weight its momentum calculated in foot tons was something incredible it had been seen to destroy a four-year-old bull by a single impact upon the animal's gnarly forehead no stone wall had ever been known to resist its downward swoop there were no trees tough enough to stay it it would splinter them into matchwood and defile their leafy honors in the dust. This irascible and implacable brute, this incarnate thunderbolt, this monster of the upper deep, I had seen reposing in the shade of an adjacent tree, dreaming dreams of conquest and glory. It was with a view of summoning it forth to the field of honor that I suspended its master in the manner described. Having completed my preparations, I imparted to the avuncular pendulum a gentle oscillation, and retired to cover behind a contiguous rock, lifting up my voice in a long, rasping cry, whose diminishing final note was drowned in a noise like that of a swearing cat, which emanated from the sack. Instantly the formidable sheep was upon its feet, and had taken in the military situation at a glance. In a few moments it had approached, stamping, to within fifty yards of the swinging foeman, who, now retreating and anon advancing, seemed to invite the fray. Suddenly I saw the beast's head drop earthward, as if depressed by the weight of its enormous horns. Then the dim, white, wavy streak of sheep prolonged itself from that spot, in a general horizontal direction, to within four yards of a point immediately beneath the enemy. There it struck sharply upward, and before it had faded from my gaze at the place whence it had set out, I heard a horrid thump and a piercing scream, and my poor uncle shot forward, with a slack rope higher than the limb to which he was attached. Here the rope taunted with a jerk, arresting his flight, and back he swung in a breathless curve to the other end of his arm. The ram had fallen, a heap of indistinguishable legs, wool, and horns, but it pulled itself together and dodging as its antagonist swept downward, it retired at random, alternately shaking its head and stamping its forefeet. When it had backed about the same distance as that from which it had delivered the assault, it paused again, bowing its head as if in prayer for victory, and again shot forward, dimly visible as before, a prolonged white streak with monstrous undulations, ending with a sharp ascension. Its course this time was at a right angle to its former one, and its impatience so great that it struck the enemy before he had nearly reached the lowest point of his arc. In consequence, he went flying round and round in a horizontal circle, whose radius was about the equal of half the length of the rope, which I forgot to say was nearly twenty feet long. His shrieks, crescendo in the approach and diminuendo in the recession, made the rapidity of his revolution more obvious to the ear than to the eye. He had evidently not yet been struck in a vital spot. His posture in the sack and the distance from the ground at which he hung 
compelled the ram to operate upon his lower extremities and at the end of his back like a plant that has struck its root into some poisonous mineral my poor uncle was dying slowly upward after delivering its second blow the ram had not again retired the fever of battle burned hot in its heart its brain was intoxicated with the wine of strife like a pugilist who in his rage forgets his skill and fights ineffectively at half arm's length the angry beast endeavored to reach its fleeing foe by awkward vertical leaps as he passed overhead sometimes indeed succeeding in striking him feebly but more frequently overthrown by its own misguided eagerness but as the impetus was exhausted and the man's circles narrowed in scope and diminished in speed bringing him nearer to the ground these tactics produced better results eliciting a superior quality of screams which i greatly enjoy suddenly as if the bugles had sung truce the ram suspended hostilities and walked away thoughtfully wrinkling and smoothing its great aquiline nose and occasionally cropping a bunch of grass and slowly munching it it seemed to have tired of war's alarm and resolved to beat the sword into a plowshare and cultivate the arts of peace steadily it held its course away from the field of fame until it had gained a distance of nearly a quarter of a mile there it stopped and stood with its rear to the foe chewing its cud and apparently half asleep i observed however an occasional slight turn of its head as if its apathy were more affected than real meanwhile my uncle william's shrieks had abated with his motion and nothing was heard from him but long low moans and at long intervals my name uttered in pleading tones exceedingly grateful to my ear evidently the man had not the faintest notion of what was being done to him and was inexpressibly terrified when death comes cloaked in mystery he is terrible indeed little by little my uncle's oscillations diminished and finally he hung motionless i went to him and was about to give him the coup de grace when i heard and felt a succession of smart shocks which shook the ground like a series of light earthquakes and turning in the direction of the ram i saw a long cloud of dust approaching me at inconceivable rapidity and alarming effect at a distance of some thirty yards away it stopped short and from the near end of it rose into the air what i at first thought a great white bird its ascent was so smooth and easy and regular that i could not realize its extraordinary celerity and was lost in admiration of its grace to this day the impression remains that it was a slow deliberate movement the ram for it was that animal being upborne by some power other than its own impetus and supported through the successive stages of its flight with infinite tenderness and care my eyes followed its progress through the air with unspeakable pleasure all the greater by contrast with my former terror of its approach by land onward and upward the noble animal sailed its head bent down almost between its knees its four feet thrown back its hind legs trailing to the rear like legs of a soaring heron at a height of forty or fifty feet as fond recollection presents it to view it attained its zenith and appeared to remain an instant stationary then tilting suddenly forward without altering the relative position of its parts it shot downward on a steeper and steeper course with augmenting velocity passed immediately above me with the noise like a rush of a cannon shot and struck my poor uncle almost squarely on top of the head so frightful was the impact that not only the man's neck was broken but the rope too and the body of the deceased forced against the earth was crushed to pulp beneath the awful front of that meteoric sheep the concussion stopped all the clocks between lone hand and dutch dance and professor davidson a distinguished authority in matters seismic who happened to be in the vicinity promptly explained that the vibrations were north to southwest altogether i cannot help thinking that in point of artistic atrocity my murder of uncle william has seldom been excelled end of my favorite murder by ambrose Bierce. my first lie and how i got out of it from the man that corrupted hadleyburg and other stories by mark twain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. My First Lie and How I Got Out of It by Mark Twain. As I understand it, what you desire is information about my first lie and how I got out of it. I was born in 1835, and I am well along, and my memory is not as good as it was. If you had asked about my first truth, it would have been easier for me and kinder of you, for I remember that fairly well. I remember it as if it were last week. The family think it was a week before, but that is flattery and probably has a selfish project back of it. When a person has become seasoned by experience and has reached the age of sixty-four, which is the age of discretion, he likes a family compliment as well as ever, but he does not lose his head over it as in the old innocent days. I do not remember my first lie. It is too far back. But I remember my second one very well. I was nine days old at the time, and had noticed that if a pin was sticking in me, and I advertised it in the usual fashion, I was lovingly petted and coddled and pitied in the most agreeable way, and got a ration between meals besides. It was human nature to want to get these riches, and I fell. I lied about the pin, advertising one when there wasn't any. You would have done it. George Washington did it. Anybody could have done it. During the first half of my life, I never knew a child that was able to rise above the temptation and keep from telling that lie. Up until 1867, all the civilized children that were ever born in the world were liars, including George. Then the safety pin came in and blocked the game. But is that reform worth anything? No, for it is a reform by force and has no virtue in it. It merely stops that form of lying. It doesn't impair the disposition to lie by a shade. It is the cradle application of conversion by fire and sword, or of the temperance principle through prohibition. To return to that early lie, they found no pin, and they realized that another liar had been added to the world supply. For by grace of a rare inspiration, a quite commonplace but seldom noticed fact was borne in upon their understandings, that almost all lies are acts and speech has no part in them. Then, if they examined a little further, they recognized that all people are liars, from the cradle onwards, without exception, and that they begin to lie as soon as they are awake in the morning, and keep it up without rest or refreshment, until they go to sleep at night. If they arrived at that truth, it probably grieved them, did if they had not been heedlessly and ignorantly educated by their books and teachers. For why should a person grieve over a thing which by the eternal law of his make he cannot help. He didn't invent the law. It is merely his business to obey it and keep still. Join the universal conspiracy and keep so still that he shall deceive his fellow conspirators into imagining that he doesn't know that the law exists. It is what we all do, we that know. I am speaking of the lie of silent assertion. We can tell it without saying a word, and we all do it. We know that. In the magnitude of its territorial spread, it is one of the most majestic lies that the civilizations make it their sacred and anxious care to guard and watch and propagate. For instance, it would not be possible for a humane and intelligent person to invent a rational excuse for slavery. Yet you will remember that in the early days of the emancipation agitation in the North, the agitators got but small help or countenance from anyone. Argue and plead and pray as they might, they could not break the universal stillness that reigned from pulpit and press all the way down to the bottom of society. The clammy stillness created and maintained by the lie of silent assertion. The silent assertion that there wasn't anything going on in which humane and intelligent people were interested. From the beginning of the Dreyfus case to the end of it all, France, except for a couple of dozen moral paladins, lay under the smother of the silent assertion lie that no wrong was being done to a persecuted and unoffending man. The little smother was over England lately, a good half of the population silently letting on that they were not aware that Mr. Chamberlain was trying to manufacture a war in South Africa, and was willing to pay fancy prices for the materials. 
Now there we have instances of three prominent, ostensibly civilizations, working the silent assertion lie. Could one find other instances in the three countries? I think so. Not so very much, perhaps, but say a billion, just so as to keep within bounds. Are those countries working that kind of lie, day in, day out, in thousands and thousands of varieties, without ever resting? Yes, we know that to be true. The universal conspiracy of the silent assertion lie is hard at work always, and everywhere, and always in the interest of a stupidity or a sham, never in the interest of a thing fine or respectable. Is it the most timid and shabby of all lies? It seems to have the look of it. For ages and ages it has mutely labored in the interest of despotism and autocracy and chattel slavery and military slavery and religious slavery and has kept them alive, keeps them alive yet, here and there and yonder, all about the globe, and it will go on keeping them alive until the silent assertion lie retires from business. The silent assertion that nothing is going on which fair and intelligent men are aware of and are engaged by their duty to try to stop. What I am arriving at is this. When whole races and peoples conspire to propagate gigantic mute lies in the interest of tyrannies and shams, why should we care anything about the trifling lies told by individuals? Why should we try to make it appear that abstention from lying is a virtue? Why should we want to beguile ourselves in that way? Why should we, without shame, help the nation lie? and then be ashamed to do a little lying on our own account. Why shouldn't we be honest and honorable, and lie every time we get the chance? That is to say, why shouldn't we be consistent and either lie all the time, or not at all? Why should we help the nation lie the whole day long and then object to telling one little individual private lie in our own interest to go to bed on? Just for the refreshment of it, I mean, and to take the rancid taste out of our mouth. Here in England they have the oddest ways. They won't tell a spoken lie. Nothing could persuade them, except in the large moral interests, like politics or religion, I mean. To tell a spoken lie, to get even the poorest little personal advantage out of it, is a thing which is impossible to them. They make me ashamed of myself sometimes. They are so bigoted. They will not even tell a lie for the fun of it. They will not tell it when it hasn't even a suggestion of damage or advantage in it, for anyone. This has a restraining influence on me in spite of reason, and I'm always getting out of the practice. Of course they tell all sorts of little unspoken lies just like anybody, but they don't notice it until their attention is called to it. They have got me so that sometimes I never tell a verbal lie now except in a modified form, and even in the modified form they don't approve of it. Still, that is as far as I can go in the interest of the growing, friendly relations between the two countries. I must keep some of my self-respect and my health. I can live on a pretty low diet, but I can't get along on no sustenance at all. Of course, there are times when these people have come out with a spoken lie, for that is a thing which happens to everybody once in a while, and would happen to the angels if they came down here much. Particularly for angels, in fact, for the lies I speak of are self-sacrificing ones, told for a generous objective, not a mean one. But even when these people tell a lie of that sort, it seems to scare them and unsettle their minds. It is a wonderful thing to see, and shows that they are all insane. In fact, it is a country which is full of the most interesting superstitions. I have an English friend of twenty-five years standing, and yesterday, when we were coming downtown on the top of the bus, I happened to tell him a lie, a modified one, of course, a half-breed, a mulatto. I can't seem to tell any other kind now. The market is so flat. I was explaining to him how I got out of an embarrassment in Austria last year. I do not know what might have become of me if I hadn't happened to remember to tell the police that I belonged to the same family as the Prince of Wales. That made everything pleasant, and they let me go and apologized, too, and were ever so kind and obliging and polite, and couldn't do too much for me, and explained how the mistake could have been made, and promised to hang the officer that did it, and hoped I would let bygones be bygones and not say anything about it, and I said they could depend on me. 
and my friend said austerely, You call it a modified lie? Where is the modification? I explained that it lay in the form of my statement to the police. I didn't say I belonged to the royal family. I only said I belonged to the same family as the prince, meaning the human family, of course, and if these people had had any penetration, they would have known it. I can't go around furnishing brains to the police. It's not to be expected. How did you feel after that performance? Well, of course I was distressed to find that the police had misunderstood me, but as long as I had not told any lie, I knew there was no occasion to sit up nights and worry about it. My friend struggled with the case several minutes, turning it over and examining it in his mind. Then he said that so far as he could see, the modification was itself a lie, it being a misleading reservation of the explanatory fact, and so I had told two lies instead of only one. I wouldn't have done it, said he. I have never told a lie, and I should be very sorry to do such a thing. Just then he lifted his hat and smiled a basketful of surprised and delighted smiles down at a gentleman who was passing in a hansom. Who was that, G? I don't know. Then why did you do that? Because I saw he thought he knew me and was expecting it of me. If I hadn't done it, he would have been hurt, and I don't want to embarrass him before the whole street. Well, your heart is in the right place, G and your act was right. What you did was kindly and courteous and beautiful. I would have done it myself, but it was a lie. A lie? I didn't say a word. How do you make it out? I know you didn't speak. Still, you said to him very plainly and enthusiastically in a dumb show, Hello, you in town. Awful glad to see you, old fellow. When did you get back? Concealed in your actions was what you called a misleading reservation of an explanatory fact, the act that you have never seen him before. You expressed joy in encountering him, a lie, and you made that reservation, another lie. It was my pair over again, and don't be troubled, we all do it. Two hours later at dinner, when quite other matters were being discussed, he told me how he happened along once, just in the nick of time, to do a great service for the family who were old friends of his. The head of it had suddenly died in circumstances and surroundings of a ruinous, disgraceful character. If known, the facts would break the hearts of the innocent family, and put upon them a load of unendurable shame. There was no help but in a giant lie, and he girded up his loins and told it. The family never found out, G? Never. In all these years they had never suspected. They were proud of him, and had always reason to be. They were proud of him yet, and to them his memory is sacred and stainless and beautiful. They had a narrow escape, G. Indeed they had. For the very next man that came along might have been one of those heartless, shameless truth-mongers. You have told the truth a million times in your life, G. But that one golden lie atones for it all. Persevere. Some may think me not strict enough with my morals, but that position is hardly tenable. There are many kinds of lying that I do not approve. I do not like the injurious lie, except when it injures someone else. And I do not like the lie of bravado, nor the lie of virtuous ecstasy. The latter is affected by Bryant, and the former by Carlyle. Mr. Bryant says, Truth, crushed to earth, will rise again. I have taken medals at thirteen world's fairs, and may claim to be not without capacity, but I never told as big a one as that. Mr. Bryant was playing to the gallery. We all do it. Carlyle said, in substance, this. I do not remember the exact words. This gospel is eternal, that a lie shall not live. I have reverence and affection for Carlyle's books and have read his revelation eight times, so I prefer to think he was not entirely at himself when he told that one. To me it is plain that he said it in a moment of excitement, when chasing Americans out of his backyard with brickbats. They used to go there and worship. At the bottom he was probably fond of it, but he was always able to conceal it. He kept bricks for them, but he was not a good shot. 
and it is a matter of history that when he fired they dodged and carried the bricks off for as a nation we like relics and so long as we get them we do not much care what the reliquary thinks about it i am quite sure that when he told that large one about the lie not being able to live he had just missed an american and was over excited he told it about thirty years ago but it is alive yet alive and very healthy and hearty and likely to outlive any fact in history carlyle was truthful when calm but give him americans enough and bricks enough and he could have taken medals himself as regards to that time george washington told the truth a word must be said of course it is a principal jewel in the crown of america and it is but natural that we should work it for all its worth as milton said in his lay of the last minstrel it was a timely and judicious lie and i should have told it myself in the circumstance but i should have stopped there it was a stately truth a lofty truth a tower and i think it was a mistake to go on and distract attention from its sublimity by building another tower alongside it fourteen times as high i refer to his remark that he could not lie i should have fed that to the marines or left it to carlyle it is just in his style it would have taken a medal at any european fair and could have got an honorable mention even at chicago if it had been saved up but let it pass the father of his country was excited i have been in those circumstances and i recollect with the truth he told i have no objection to offer it's already indicated i think it was not premeditated but an inspiration with his fine military mind he had probably arranged to let his brother edward in for the cherry tree results but by an inspiration he saw his opportunity in time and took advantage of it by telling the truth he could astonish his father his father would tell the neighbors the neighbors would spread it it would travel to all firesides and in the end it would make him president not only that but first president he was a far-seeing boy and would be likely to think of these things therefore to my mind he stands justified for what he did but not the other tower it was a mistake still i don't know about that upon reflection i think perhaps it wasn't for indeed it is that tower that makes the other one live if he had not said i cannot tell a lie there would have been no convulsion that was the earthquake that rocked the planet that was the kind of statement that lives forever and a fact barnacled to it has a good chance of sharing its immortality to sum up i am on the whole satisfied with things the way they are there is a prejudice against the spoken lie but none against any other and by examination and mathematical computation i find that the proportion of the spoken lie to the other varieties is as one to twenty two thousand eight hundred and ninety four therefore the spoken lie is of no consequence and it is not worth while to go around fussing about it and trying to make believe that it is an important matter the silent colossal national lie that is the support and confederation of all the tyrants and shams and inequities and unfairnesses that affect the people that is the one to throw bricks and sermons at but let us be judicious let someone else begin but then but i have wandered from my text how did i get out of my second lie i think i got out with honor but i cannot be sure for it was a long time ago and some of the details have faded out of my memory I recollect that I was reversed and stretched across someone's knee, and that something happened, but I cannot now remember what it was. I think there was music, but it is all dim now and blurred with the lapse of time. This may be only a senile fancy. The End of My First Lie and How I Got Out of It by Mark Twain The Quarrel of the Monkey and the Crab by Theodora Ozaki. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Long, long ago, one bright autumn day in Japan, it happened that a pink-faced monkey and a yellow crab were playing together along the bank of a river. As they were running about, the crab found a rice dumpling, and the monkey a persimmon seed. The crab picked up the rice dumpling and showed it to the monkey, saying, Look what a nice thing I have found. Then the monkey held up the persimmon seed and said, I also have found something good. Look. Now, though the monkey is always very fond of persimmon fruit, he had no use for the seed he had just found. The persimmon seed is as hard and uneatable as stone. He therefore, in his greedy nature, felt very envious of the crab's nice dumpling, and he proposed an exchange. The crab naturally did not see why he should give up his prize for a hard, stone-like seed, and would not consent to the monkey's proposition. Then the cunning monkey began to persuade the crab, saying, How unwise you are not to think of the future. Your rice dumpling can be eaten now and is certainly much bigger than my seed. But if you sow this seed in the ground, it will soon grow and become a great tree in a few years, and bear an abundance of fine persimmons year after year. Why, if only I could show it to you then, with the yellow fruit hanging on its branches. Of course, if you don't believe me, I shall sow it myself. Though I am sure later on you will be very sorry that you did not take my advice. The simple minded crab could not resist the monkey's clever persuasion. He at last gave in and consented to the monkey's proposal, and the exchange was made. The greedy monkey soon gobbled up the dumpling, and with great reluctance gave up the persimmon seed to the crab. He would have liked to keep that too but he was afraid of making the crab angry and of being pinched by his sharp scissor-like claws they then separated the monkey going home to his forest trees and the crab to his stones along the riverside as soon as the crab reached home he put the persimmon seed in the ground as the monkey had told him in the following spring the crab was delighted to see the shoot of a young tree push its way up through the ground each year it grew bigger, till at last it blossomed one spring, and in the following autumn bore some fine large persimmons. Among the broad smooth green leaves the fruit hung like golden balls, and as they ripened they mellowed to a deep orange. It was the little crab's pleasure to go out day by day and sit in the sun and put out his long eyes in the same way as a snail puts out its horn and watch the persimmons ripening to perfection. How delicious they will be to eat, he said to himself. At last, one day, he knew the persimmons must be quite ripe, and he wanted very much to taste one. He made several attempts to climb the tree, in the vain hope of reaching one of the beautiful persimmons hanging above him. But he failed each time, for a crab's legs are not made for climbing trees, but only for running along the ground and over stones both of which he can do most cleverly. In his dilemma, he thought of his old playmate, the monkey, who, he knew, could climb trees better than anyone else in the world. He determined to ask the monkey to help him, and set out to find him. Running crab fashion up the stony river bank, over the pathways, into the shadowy forest, the crab at last found the monkey, taking an afternoon nap in his favorite pine tree with his tail curled tight around a branch to prevent him from falling off in his dreams. He was soon wide awake, however, when he heard himself called, and eagerly listening to what the crab told him, when he had heard that the seed which he had long ago exchanged for a rice dumpling had grown into a tree and was now bearing good fruit. He was delighted, for at once he devised a cunning plan which would give him all the persimmons for himself. He consented to go with the crab to pick the fruit for him. When they both reached the spot, the monkey was astonished to see what a fine tree had sprung from the seed, 
and with what a number of ripe persimmons the branches were loaded he quickly climbed the tree and began to pluck and eat as fast as he could one persimmon after another each time he chose the best and ripest he could find and went on eating till he could eat no more not one would he give to the poor hungry crab waiting below and when he had finished there was little but the hard unripe fruit left you can imagine the feelings of the poor crab after waiting patiently for so long as he had done for the tree to grow and the fruit to ripen when he saw the monkey devouring all the good persimmons he was so disappointed that he ran round and round the tree calling to the monkey to remember his promise the monkey at first took no notice of the crab's complaints but at last he picked out the hardest greenest persimmon he could find and aimed it at the crab's head the persimmon is as hard as stone when it is unripe the monkey's missile struck home and the crab was sorely hurt by the blow again and again as fast as he could pick them the monkey pulled off the hard persimmons and threw them at the defenseless crab till he dropped dead covered with wounds all over his body there he lay a pitiful sight at the foot of the tree he had himself planted when the wicked monkey saw that he had killed the crab he ran away from the spot as fast as he could in fear and trembling like a coward as he was now the crab had a son who had been playing with a friend not far from the spot where this sad work had taken place on the way home he came across his father dead in a most dreadful condition his head was smashed and his shell broken in several places and around his body lay the unripe persimmons which had done their deadly work at this dreadful sight the poor young crab sat down and wept but when he had wept for some time he told himself that this crying would do no good it was his duty to avenge his father's murder and this he determined to do he looked about for some clue which would lead him to discover the murderer looking up at the tree he had noticed that the best fruit had gone and that all around lay bits of peel and numerous seeds strewn on the ground as well as the unripe persimmons which had evidently been thrown at his father then he understood that the monkey was the murderer for he now remembered that his father had once told him the story of the rice dumpling and the persimmon seed the young crab knew that the monkeys liked persimmons above all other fruit and he felt sure that his greed for the coveted fruit had been the cause of the old crab's death alas he at first thought of going to attack the monkey at once for he burned with rage second thoughts however told him that this was useless for the monkey was an old and cunning animal and would be hard to overcome he must meet cunning with cunning and ask some of his friends to help him for he knew it would be quite out of his power to kill him alone the young crab set out at once to call on the mortar his father's old friend and told him of all that had happened he besought the mortar with tears to help him avenge his father's death the mortar was very sorry when he heard the woeful tale and promised at once to help the young crab punish the monkey to death he warned him that he must be very careful in what he did for the monkey was a strong and cunning enemy the mortar now sent to fetch the bee and the chestnut also the crab's old friends to consult them about the matter in a short time the bee and the chestnut arrived when they were told all the details of the old crab's death and of the monkey's wickedness and greed they both gladly consented to help the young crab in his revenge after talking for a long time as to the ways and means of carrying out their plans they separated and mr mortar went home with the young crab to help him bury his poor father while all this was taking place the monkey was congratulating himself as the wicked often do before their punishment comes upon them on all he had done so neatly he thought it quite a fine thing that he'd robbed his friend of all his ripe persimmons and then that he had killed him still 
smile as hard as he might he could not banish altogether the fear of the consequences should the evil deeds be discovered if he were found out and he told himself that this could not be for he had escaped unseen the crab's family would be sure to bear him hatred and seek to take revenge on him so he would not go out and kept to himself at home for several days he found this kind of life however extremely dull accustomed as he was to the free life of the woods and at last he said no one knows that it was i who killed the crab i am sure that the old thing breathed his last breath before i left him dead crabs have no mouths who is there to tell that i am the murderer since no one knows what is the use of shutting myself up and brooding over the matter what is done cannot be undone with this he wandered out into the crab settlement and crept about as slyly as possible near the crab's house and tried to hear the neighbors gossip round about he wanted to find out what the crabs were saying about their chief's death for the old crab had been the chief of the tribe but he heard nothing and said to himself they are all such fools that they don't know and don't care who murdered their chief little did he know in his so-called monkey's wisdom that this seeming unconcern was part of the young crab's plan he purposely pretended not to know who killed his father and also to believe that he had met his death through his own fault by this means he could the better keep secret the revenge on the monkey which he was meditating so the monkey returned home from his walk quite content he told himself he had nothing now to fear one fine day when the monkey was sitting at home he was surprised by the appearance of a messenger from the young crab while he was wondering what this might mean the messenger bowed before him and said i have been sent by my master to inform you that his father died the other day in falling from a persimmon tree while trying to climb the tree after fruit this being the seventh day is the first anniversary after his death and my master has prepared a little festival in his father's honor and bids you come to participate in it as you are one of his best friends my master hopes you will honor his house with your kind visit when the monkey heard these words he rejoiced in his inmost heart for all his fears of being suspected were now at rest he could not guess that a plot had just been set in motion against him he pretended to be very surprised at the news of the crab's death and said i am indeed very sorry to hear of your chief's death we were great friends as you know i remember that once we exchanged a rice dumpling for a persimmon seed it grieves me much to think that this seed was in the end the cause of his death i accept your invitation with many thanks i shall be delighted to do honor to my poor old friend and he screwed some false tears from his eyes the messenger laughed inwardly and thought the wicked monkey is now dropping false tears but within a short time he shall shed real ones but aloud he thanked the monkey politely and went home when he had gone the wicked monkey laughed aloud at what he thought was the young crab's innocence <laughs> and without the least feeling began to look forward to the feast to be held that day in honor of the dead crab to which he had been invited he changed his dress and set out solemnly to visit the young crab he found all the members of the crab's family and his relatives waiting to receive and welcome him as soon as the bows of meeting were over they led him to a hall here the young chief mourner came to receive him expressions of condolence and thanks were exchanged between them and then they all sat down to a luxurious feast and entertained the monkey as the guest of honor the feast over he was next invited to the tea ceremony room to drink a cup of tea when the young crab had conducted the monkey to the tea room he left him and retired time passed and still he did not return at last the monkey became impatient he said to himself 
This tea ceremony is always a very slow affair. I am tired of waiting so long. I am very thirsty after drinking so much sake at the dinner. He then approached the charcoal fireplace and began to pour out some hot water from the kettle boiling there. When something burst out from the ashes with a great pop and hit the monkey right in the neck. It was the chestnut, one of the old crab's friends, who had hidden himself in the fireplace. The monkey, taken by surprise, jumped backward and then started to run out of the room. The bee, who was hiding outside the screens, now flew out and stung him on the cheek. The monkey was in great pain. His neck was burned by the chestnut and his face badly stung by the bee. But he ran on screaming and chattering with rage. Now, the stone mortar had hidden himself with several other stones on top of the crab's gate, and as the monkey ran underneath the mortar, and all fell down on top of the monkey's head. Was it possible for the monkey to bear the weight of the mortar, falling on him from the top of the gate? He lay crushed and in great pain, quite unable to get up. As he lay there helpless, the young crab came up, and, holding his great claw scissors over the monkey, he said, Do you now remember that you murdered my father? Then you are my enemy, gasped the monkey brokenly. Of course, said the young crab. It was your father's fault, not mine, gasped the unrepentant monkey. Can you still lie? I will soon put an end to your breath. And with that, he cut off the monkey's head with his pincher claws. Thus, the wicked monkey met his well-merited punishment, and the young crab avenged his father's death. This is the end of the story of the monkey, the crab, and the persimmon seed. The Quarrel of the Monkey and the Crab by Theodora Ozaki The Road to Fortune, from The Fairy Ring, edited by Kate Douglas Wigan and Nora Archibald Smith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. The Road to Fortune One fine morning, two young men were strolling together through the fields when they perceived, at a great distance, a very high hill, on the top of which stood a beautiful castle, which sparkled so brightly in the sunshine that the youths were quite delighted, and could not help gazing at it. "'Let us go to it,' said one of the lads. "'It is easy to say, let us go, but how can we walk so far?' retorted the other, who was a lazy fellow. "'You may do it easily,' replied a clear voice behind them. On looking around to see whence these words came, they perceived a beautiful fairy standing on a large ball, which rolled along with her upon it, in the direction of the castle. It is no very difficult task for her, in all events. Look, she can get forward without moving a limb, said the lazy one, throwing himself down on the grass. The other, however, was not so easily satisfied, for, without stopping to reflect, he started off after the fairy as fast as he could run and catching hold of the skirts of her robe, cried, Who art thou? I am Fortune, answered the fairy, and yonder is my castle. Follow me there. If thou reachest it before midnight, I will receive thee as a friend. But remember, shouldst thou arrive one moment later, my door will be closed against thee. With these words the fairy drew her robe from the hand of the young man, and went off so quickly upon her ball that she was soon out of sight. The youth immediately ran back to his companion and told him all that had happened, adding, I intend to take the fairy's advice. Will you accompany me? Are you mad? inquired the other. For my part, if I had a good horse, I should not mind the journey. But as for walking all that way, I certainly shall not attempt it. Farewell, then, answered his comrade, who started off at a brisk pace in the direction of the castle. The lazy one, however, reasoned thus to himself. 
exert yourself as much as you please my worthy friend good fortune often comes while we are dozing perhaps it will be my case today and without more ado he stretched himself on the grass and fell fast asleep not however before he had cast a longing glance at the beautiful castle on the hill after sleeping for some time he felt as though there were a warm wind blowing in his ear and when he had stretched his slothful limbs and rubbed his sleepy eyes he perceived a beautiful milk-white horse ready saddled standing beside him shaking his mane and neighing lustily in the clear morning air ah did i not say as much cried the youth oh if people would but trust to fate come here you fine creature we must be good friends so saying he threw himself into the saddle and the steed galloped off with him as swiftly as the wind thus mounted our lazy friend very soon overtook his industrious companion and hailed him as he passed crying show respect for my horse's heels the other however continued on a steady pace without paying much heed to his satire about midday on arriving at the summit of the beautiful hill the horse suddenly stopped quite right cried his rider i find you a very sagacious creature soft and fairly is a good proverb the castle is now not very far off but my appetite is a great deal nearer so dismounting he sought out a shady slope and having laid down in the moss with his feet against the stump of a tree he began to take some refreshment for happily he had a good supply of bread and sausage in his pocket and a pleasant drink in his flask as soon as the youth had satisfied his appetite he began to feel rather drowsy and as is usual with indolent people he gave full vent to the inclination stretching himself on the moss and fell into a sound sleep never had a man a more pleasant sleep nor accompanied by more delightful dreams he imagined that he was already in the castle reposing on silken cushions and that all that he desired came to him immediately upon his beckoning with his little finger after thus enjoying himself for some time it seemed as though the fireworks went off with a great explosion this was followed by strains of soft music which went to the tune of a song he had often heard each verse of which terminated with these words healthful limbs and spirits gay bear the traveller on his way this continued some time when he awoke with the song still ringing in his ears then rubbing his eyes he perceived that the setting sun was fast sinking behind the castle and heard the voice of his companion singing from the valley before him the very words he had heard in his dream what a time i have slept cried the lazy fellow it is high time that i was getting on my way come here my steed where are you but no steed was to be found the only creature that he could see after looking all around was an old gray donkey grazing on the top of the hill at some distance he shouted and whistled with all his might but the horse was quite gone out of hearing and the old donkey did not seem to pay the least attention so after exerting his lungs to no purpose the lazy fellow was obliged to go and try to make friends with the gray old beast which allowed itself to be quietly mounted and then trudged slowly on with him but our youth found this kind of travel very different from the previous stage for then he had not only proceeded at a much quicker pace but had a more comfortable seat which was by no means an unimportant consideration with him in the course of a short time it began to grow dark and heavy clouds overspread the sky already he could perceive that the castle was being lighted up and now he began to be very frightened and anxious to get forward the donkey however did not seem in any way to partake of his feelings but continued on at an even slower pace than before at length it became quite dark and the donkey after going slower and slower came to a dead stand in the midst of the thick woods all his entreaties were of no use nor were the threats and kicks of more avail the donkey would not move at last the writer became so exasperated that he struck it with his fist but this did not much improve our lazy friend's condition for the obstinate brute instantly flung up its hind legs and by that process released itself from its burden which fell heavily on the ground it required much less violence than our youth experienced in his fall to prove to him that he was not lying on a satin couch for his legs and arms were dreadfully bruised he remained some time in this miserable plight 
but the bright and inviting appearance of the lights in the castle at length attracted his attention. Ah, he thought, what beautiful beds must be there in that fine building. This thought alone aroused for a moment his sluggish energies, and he managed to get on his feet. Perhaps, he thought, the old gray donkey may by this time have gotten into a better temper. So he searched around for him in every direction, but after knocking his head against the trees here, tearing his face at the thorns there, and stumbling over roots and stones for a full quarter of an hour without finding it, he gave up the search as hopeless. It was high time, however, that he made some effort to get out of this dismal wood, which every now and then resounded with dreary howls sounding very much as though they proceeded from the throats of hungry wolves. At last, when quite bewildered with fear, he suddenly stumbled against something soft and slimy. He knew by the touch that it was not the donkey, but fancying it to be in the form of a saddle, he was about to bestride it at once. Yet he found it so cold and damp to the touch that he quite shuddered at the thought. He was still hesitating when the castle clock struck, and he counted eleven. Recollecting that it was drawing near to the eventful time, and that he had no other hope, he threw himself on what appeared to be the saddle. He found his seat tolerably easy. It was very soft, and at his back was something to lean against. Another great advantage was that the creature on which he was mounted seemed to be very sure-footed. There was, however, one great objection to it. That was the creeping pace at which it moved for it went along much slower than even the obstinate donkey. Proceeding thus, for some time, he got so near to the castle that he could count the windows, and in this occupation he was engaged when suddenly the moon shone out from between the clouds, and, oh, horror, what did he behold? The creature on which he sat was neither a horse nor a donkey, but an enormous snail, quite as large as a calf and its house, which it carried on its back, had served him to lean against. Now he could well understand why he had come at such a creeping pace. He turned as cold as death, and his hair stood on end with fright. But there was now no time for fear, for the castle clock had already made the woods resound with the first stroke of the midnight hour, just as his steed crawled out from the woods. Then how great was the young man's astonishment, when he beheld the castle of fortune in all its grandeur. Hitherto he had sat quietly on the snail without hastening it, or in any way interfering with its pace. At the sight of the castle, however, he dashed both his heels into its sides, and attempted to urge it on. To this treatment the snail was quite unaccustomed, and instantly drew its head into its shell and left the youth sprawling on the ground. The castle clock rang out a second stroke, had the lazy fellow but mustered up resolution and trusted to his feet even then, he might have reached the castle in time. But no. There he stood, crying bitterly and screaming out, A beast, a beast, of whatever kind it may be, to carry me to yon castle. The inmates of the building had already begun to extinguish the lights, and the moon being hidden by the clouds, he was again in total darkness. As the clock struck the third time, he heard something moving near him, and, as well as he could make out in the dark, it seemed to be a saddled horse. "'Ah, that is my long-lost steed,' he cried, "'that heaven has kindly sent to me in the needful moment.' As quickly as his lazy limbs would enable him, he leapt on the back of the creature. There was now only little elevation to surmount, and he could easily see his companion standing at the open door of the castle waving his cap and beckoning him on. The clock chimed out the fourth stroke when the creature upon which he sat began to move slowly. Then went the fifth and sixth strokes, and it began to advance a little in a very awkward pace. At the seventh the creature began to move first sideways, then went backward. To his great horror and surprise the writer found that he could not throw himself off, though he struggled with all his might. By a passing ray of the moon he discovered that the new steed on which he was riding was a horrid monster with ten legs, and from either side there extended a large claw, with which it held him fast by the arms. The youth screamed loudly for help, but all to no purpose. The animal still kept receding further and further from the castle, 
while the eventful moment approached nearer and nearer, until the twelfth stroke proclaimed the midnight hour. A flitting ray of the moon displayed the castle once more to his view, in all its splendor. But in the same moment the youth heard the door shut, and the rattling noise of chains and bolts. The entrance to the castle of fortune was closed against him forever. The moon now shone again in full luster, and discovered the horrid monster, that still kept carrying him away, to be nothing more or less than an enormous crab. Where he went to on this uncommon steed I cannot tell. For the fact is, nobody ever troubled themselves further with the lazy fellow. End of The Road to Fortune Rushkulum or the Wise Simpleton, A Legend of Clare by J. M. Teague This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rushkulum or the Wise Simpleton Corny Naylan, our village schoolmaster, when any question of arithmetic may be proposed to him, which he is in no humour to answer, and would rather turn off by a joke, has been frequently known to reply to it by asking another question like this. Now, boys, you're striving to puzzle me, and I'll engage none of ye can answer something that I'll ask you now. What is it, Corney? Let's hear it. How many grains of oaten mill are contained in one given square foot of stirabout? This, in its turn, a poser but probably the number of schemes, tricks, and contrivances in an Irish cranium might be found as hard to be enumerated as the grains of meal in the aforesaid foot of stirabout. Thus, while around the blazing turf fire on a winter's evening, the story, the pipe, and the joke take their rounds by turn, you will invariably discover that that tale always gains a double share of applause, which may contain a relation of some clever successful scheme or trick or the sayings and doings of some remarkably clever fellow albeit perhaps a great rogue in fact such stories as these are suited to the conceptions and tastes of a shrewd and ready-witted people but without tiring my reader with any more shanikus for so we term palava in clare let me endeavour to present him with one of these very stories which, if it boasteth not of much interest, may perhaps amuse him by its originality. Honour to that man, whomsoever he may be, who first rescued these curious legends from oblivion, and found in our Irish penny journal an excellent repository for their safer preservation. The reader must not be surprised if my story contains a slight dash of the marvellous, probably bordering on the hyperbolical, but this, which I verily believe is but a kind of ornament, something superadded by the genius of the narrators, as it has descended, must be taken as it is meant, and will in most instances be found capable of translation, as it were, into language easily and naturally to be explained. A very long time ago, then, somewhere in the western part of the province of Munster, lived in a small and wretched cabin a poor widow, named Moirene Mera she had three sons two of whom were fine young men but the third and of him we shall soon hear a good deal though strong and active was of a lazy disposition which resulted as his mother at least always thought not so much from any fault of his own as from his natural foolishness of character in fact she really considered him as of that class called in ireland naturals but before we say anything of the third son, let us trace the histories of his two elder brothers. Now the first, whose name was Michal Moore, or Michael Bigfellow, either that he considered the small pot of land which his mother held quite unable to support the family, or was actuated by some desire to improve his condition away from home, never let his mother rest one moment until she had consented to his starting, in order that he might, as he said, should he fall in with a good master return and make her comfortable for the remainder of her days to this plan after much hesitation maureen mera at length agreed and the day was fixed by michal for starting and mother said he though you have but little left 
and it is wrong to deprive you of it if you would but make me a fine cake of wheat and bread and if you could but spare me one of the hens ah that would be too much to ask against the long road could you mother why not michael i could never refuse you anything and you will want the cake and the hen badly enough and michal a vic astor if you should ever meet one of the good people or anything you may think isn't right pass it by and say not a word it was evening when he began his expedition nor did he stop on the road till daylight returned when he found himself in the centre of a wood and very faint and hungry seeing a convenient-looking rock near a place where he thought it most probable he should find water he seated himself with the intention of satisfying his hunger and thirst he had not been many moments engaged in eating some of his bread and had just commenced an attack on the hen by taking off one of her wings when there came up to him a poor greyhound which looked the very picture of starvation greyhounds are proverbially thin but this was thinner than the thinnest and it was easy to see had doubtlessly left at home a numerous young family Michal Moor was so very intent on eating that he heeded not the, imp the imploring look of the poor greyhound, and it was not till, wonderful to say, she addressed him in intelligible Irish, that he deigned to notice her. But when the first word came from her mouth, he was sure she must be one of those against any communication with whom his mother had so emphatically warned him, and accordingly determined to apply her maxim strictly to the occurrence you are a traveller i see said the greyhound and were doubtless weary and fainting with hunger when you took your seat here i am the mother of a numerous and helpless family who are even now clamorous for subsistence this i am unable to afford them unless i am myself supported you have now the means afford it to me then if only in the shape of a few of the hen's small bones i will be for ever grateful and may perhaps be the means of serving you in return when you may most want and least expect it but michal continued sedulously picking the bones and when he had finished he put them all back into his wallet still resolving to have nothing whatever to do with this fairy represented as he imagined by the greyhound well she said piteously since you give me nothing follow me you are perhaps in search of service my master who knows not my faculty of speech lives near he may assist you and see she continued as he followed behold that well had you relieved me it was in my power to have changed its contents which are of blood to the finest virgin honey but the honey is beneath the blood neither can it now be changed however try your fortune and if you are a reasonably sensible fellow i may relent and be reconciled to you michal still answered not a word but followed the greyhound until she came to the gate of a comfortable farmer's residence she entered the door and michal saw her occupy her place at the side of the fire and that she was quickly besieged by a number of clamorous postulants whose wants she seemed but poorly adequate to support at a glance he perceived that the house contained a master and a mistress but an old lady in the chimney-corner having by her a pair of crutches made him quail by the sinister expression of her countenance still nothing daunted he asked the master of the house at once for employment plenty of employment have i friend and good wages answered he but i am a man of a thousand and i may also say not one man of a thousand will stop with me in this house and may i ask the reason of this sir said michal taking off his hat respectfully i will answer you immediately but first follow me into my garden there said he pointing to a heap of bones which lay bleaching on the ground they are the bones of those unfortunate persons who have followed in my service if now therefore you should so wish you have my full permission to depart unhurt if you will brave them hear now the terms on which i must be served sir answered michal you surprise me i have travelled far have no money neither any more to eat say therefore your terms and if i can at all reconcile myself to them 
i am prepared to stop here you must understand then said the farmer that i hold my lands by a very unusual tenure this is not my fault however you will find me an indulgent master to you at all events for in fact you may chance to be my master as much as i yours or perhaps more for these are the terms if i at any time first find fault with any one thing you may say or do you are to be solemnly bound to take this pointing to an immense and sharp axe and forthwith without a word strike me till i shall be dead but should you at any one time first find fault with any of my words or actions i must be equally bound to do the very same dreadful thing to yourself blame me not therefore should you find fault with me for it will be my destiny nay my duty to do as i have described and on the contrary if it happen otherwise i must be ready to submit to my fate consider and reply oh my master said michalmont i have but the alternative of salvation i am in a strangely wild country without a friend i must die if i proceed and nothing more dreadful than death can happen to me here i therefore throw myself on your compassion and agree to your terms they then returned to the house and michal felt somewhat refreshed even by the smell alone of the savoury viands which the mistress was then preparing for the afternoon's repast the greyhound too cast occasionally wistful glances towards the operations going forward at length the dinner hour being all but arrived the old lady in the chimney corner then opened her lips for the first time since michal had come in and expressed a wish to go out and take a walk for said she i have not been out for some weeks ever since our last servant left us what is your name my man so he told her come out then said she michal and assist me about the garden for i am completely cramped michal muttered a few words about dinner hunger and so on but was interrupted by the farmer who said michal you must attend my mother she has sometimes strange fancies besides remember our agreement do you find fault with me oh by no means sir said michal frightened i must do my business i suppose the dinner was actually laid out on the plates to every one when michal and the old lady walked out no sooner had they done so than the greyhound before she could be prevented pounced on his dinner and devoured it in a moment the old lady thought proper to walk for some hours in the garden and now was michal very hungry for he had tasted nothing since he had finished the hen early that morning he almost began to wish that he had relieved the greyhound when they came in at last the supper was being prepared michal was now quite certain that his wants would be attended to but how woefully was he doomed to be disappointed for no sooner had they entered the house than the accursed old lady seized a large cake of wheaten bread which was baking on the embers and hastily spreading on it a coat of butter directed michal to attend her again into the garden he could say nothing for his master's eyes were upon him he was completely bewildered in despair he went with the old lady and as it was a lovely moonlight night she stopped out an unusual time and it was very late when they came in michal stretched himself quite fainting on the bed but slept not a wink how i wish now thought he that i had given the greyhound not only the small bones but even half my hen the next morning the family early assembled for breakfast and again were the cakes put down to bake over a glowing fire again did the old lady seize one and command michal into the garden he was now completely exhausted and determined to expostulate with his master when he came in went up to him craving some food no said the farmer we never eat except at stated times and my mother keeps the keys ah sir have pity on me answered michal how can i exist or do your business and can you blame me said the master michal now quite losing sight of the agreement and confused by the question put in so treacherous a manner answered that of course he could not but blame any person who would permit such infamous conduct 
here was the signal Michal, in his enfeebled state was no match for the sturdy farmer and in a moment his head was rolling on the floor by a vigorous stroke of the fatal axe while grins of satisfaction might be seen playing on the countenance both of the old lady and her greyhound the feelings of the poor widow may be imagined when no tidings ever reached her of her Michal more but on the expiration of a year the second son Porthric Douve, or Patrick Blackfellow, so called from his dark complexion, also prevailed on his mother to let him go in search of his brother and employment. But why should I describe again the horrid scene? Let me satisfy you by merely saying that precisely the same occurrences also happened to poor Porthric Douve, as that his bones were added to those of his brother, and of the other victims behind the farmer's garden but when in the course of another year neither michal nor porthric appeared the widow's grief was unbounded how was she then astonished when the fool as he was always called although his real name was rushkulum actually volunteered to do the same nothing could stop him go he would so the cake was baked and the hen was killed and roasted and rushkulum the fool set out on his expedition and there at the rock in the wood was that very same greyhound and as soon as she had looked him in the face he said why poor thing i have here what i cannot eat and you seem badly to need it here are the bones and some of this cake it was then the greyhound addressed him come with me said she lo here is the well of which your two brothers could not drink behold here is the honey on the top clear and pure but the blood is far beneath when the fool had satisfied himself at this well he followed the greyhound to the farmer's house it may be barely possible that by the road he received from her some excellent advice the conversation that ensued when rushkulum arrived at the farmer's and offered himself for his servant was much of the same nature as i have before detailed while relating the former part of my story but said rushkulum the fool i will not bind myself to these terms for ever i might get tired of you or you of me so if you please i will agree to stop with you for certain till we hear the cuckoo cry when we are together to this they agreed and went into the house however just before they stepped in the farmer asked rushkulum his name why said he mine is a very curious name it is so curious a name indeed that you would never learn it and where is the occasion of breaking your jaws every time trying to call me pondracalutha shokun which is my real name when you may as well call me always the boy well that we will do answered the master the dinner was now prepared and laid out on the plates and the old tricks about to be played rushkulum as with the others could not find fault for fool as he was he knew the consequences as he went out with the old lady she too inquired his name why really said he to her mine is a name that no one i venture to say was ever called before all my brothers and sisters died and my father and mother thought that perhaps an unusual queer kind of name might have luck so they called me mahane and reader if thou understandest not our vernacular know that mahane signifies in english myself they spent some hours as usual in the garden and rushkulum returned tired and exhausted but when he expected to get his supper and when she again brought him out and ate the fine hot buttered cake before his very eyes it was more than flesh and blood could stand however he pretended not to mind it in the least and was very civil to the old lady amusing her by his silly stories and now ma'am said he let us walk a little way down this sunny bank before we go in certain it was that the sun did happen to shine on the bank at that very time but it was to what were growing on it that he wished to direct her close attention for when he came to a certain place where there was a cavity filled by a rank growth of nettles thistles and thorns he gave his charge such a shove as sent her sprawling and kicking in the midst of them uttering wild shrieks for the pain was great but rushkulum had no notion of helping her out 
and ran into the house which was some distance away desiring the farmer to run for that his mother would walk there and had fallen into a hole from which he could not get her out and then the farmer ran and cried oh mother where are you what has happened alas my son here i am down in this hole help me out i am ruined disfigured for life and who is it said the farmer that has dared to serve you thus oh said she it was mahani mahani aver mahani myself has ruined myself who said the farmer as he helped her out oh it was mahani answered she mahani aver mahani well then said the farmer i suppose it can't be helped as it was yourself that did it so here boy take her on your back and carry her home it was but an accident so rushkulam carried her off and put her to bed she all the time crying out ah but it was myself that ruined myself till her son thought her half cracked she was quite unable to rise next morning so rushkulam the fool made an excellent and hearty breakfast which he took care also to share with the greyhound but then the old lady called her son to her bedside and explained how that it was the boy who had done the mischief and i command you said she to get rid of him and for that purpose desire him at once to go and make guise na guise na gourash the road of the sheep's feet that you have long been intending to do and then to send him with the flock over the road to the land of the giant we shall then never see him more and it is better to lose even a flock of sheep than have him longer here now that he has discovered our trick the farmer called rushkulam to him and taxed him with what he had done to his mother and said rushkulam could you blame me why no answered the farmer remembering his part of the agreement i don't blame you but you must never do it any more and now you must take these pointing to the sheep and because the bog is soft on the road to the land of the giant you must make the road of sheep's feet for them to go over and come back when they are fat and the giant will support you while you are there do you blame me for that no said rushkulam driving away the sheep but contrary to all their expectations in an hour's time in marched drusculum covered with bog dirt and blood oh said he i have had hard work since and made a good deal of the road of the sheep's legs but indeed there are not half enough legs after all and you must give me more legs if you would wish the road made firm and you rascal do you tell me you have cut off the legs of all my sheep every one sir did you not desire me do you blame me oh dear no by no means only take care and don't do it any more they went on tolerably for a few days for they were afraid of rushkulam and let him alone till one morning the farmer told him he was going to a wedding that night and that he might go with him well said rushkulam what is a wedding what will they do there why answered the farmer a wedding is a fine place where there is a good supper and two people are joined together as man and wife oh is that it i should like much to see what they'll do well then you must promise me to do what i'll tell you with the horses when we are going why what shall i do oh only when we are going don't take your eyes from the horses till we get there then have your two eyes on my plate and an eye on every other person's plate and then you'll see what they'll do rushkulam said nothing they went to the wedding but when they sat down to supper all were surprised to find a round thing on their plates covered with blood and not looking very tempting but the farmer soon guessed the sad truth and calling rushkulam aside he sternly asked him what he had done can you blame me answered the provoking rushkulam did you not desire me not to take the eyes from the horses till i got here and to put them on the plates and two on your own plate and that i would see what they would do then oh don't imagine i blame you said the farmer but i meant your own eyes all the time and mind me don't do it any more 
they were all by this time heartily sick of Rushkullum, especially the old lady, who had never left her bed. And one morning, feeling something better, she called the farmer to her bedside and addressed him thus. "'You know, my son, that your agreement with that rascal will terminate when you both shall hear the cuckoo. Now in my youth I could imitate the cuckoo so well that I have had them flying round me. Put me up, therefore, in a big holly-bush, take him along with you to cut a tree near, and I will then cry cuckoo, cuckoo, and the agreement will be broken.' said she chuckling to herself this seemed a capital idea so the farmer lifted his mother out of bed and put her up into the holly bush calling rushgulum to bring the big axe for that he intended to fell a tree rushgulum did as he was desired and commenced cutting down a certain tree which the farmer pointed out and not long had he been thus engaged when the old lady in the holly bush cried out cuckoo cuckoo ha ah, what's that said the farmer that sounds like the cuckoo oh that cannot be said rushgulum for this is winter but now the cuckoo was heard beyond a doubt well said rushgulum before i've done with you i'll go and see this cuckoo why you stupid fool said the farmer no man ever saw the cuckoo never mind said rushgulum it can be no harm to look wouldn't you think now that the cuckoo was speaking out of the holly bush oh not at all perhaps she is five miles away come away at once and give up your place did not we both hear her stop said rushgulum stay back don't make a noise there did you not see something moving ay that must be the cuckoo so saying he hurled the axe up into the holly bush with his whole force cutting away the branches scattering the leaves and berries and with one blow severing the head from the shoulders of the farmer's mother oh said the farmer my poor old mother oh what have you done you villain you have murdered my mother and said rushgulum seeming surprised i suppose you blame me for this do you and now the farmer taken by surprise and in the heat of his passion answered how dare you you black-hearted villain ask me such a question of course i do have you not murdered my mother alas my poor old mother oh very well said rushgulum as the farmer continued looking at his mother and lamenting perhaps you also remember our own little agreement i have but too good reason to think that you and your accursed old mother by your schemes caused the death of my two fine brothers but now for the fulfilment of my share of the bargain in a moment the axe descended on his head and rushgulum the wise simpleton having now got rid of his enemies took possession of all the farmer's property returned home for his mother and lived free from care or further sorrow for the remainder of his happy life but he never forgot the services of the greyhound and never allowed her to want and here let us conclude our legend by observing by way of moral be ever charitable to the distressed whether of the brute or human kind for you know not but that they also may belong to the ranks of the good people end of rushgulum or the wise simpleton a legend of clare by j g mcteague